going? Good afternoon, everyone, um, or good morning, depending upon, or evening, depending upon where you're zooming in from. Um, and my name, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Blair Bunmagura, and I am the founder of the Art Song Preservation Society. Um, and I'm delighted to welcome you today. Um, we actually have a music festival going on this week from um, at Manhattan School of Music in New York City. Um, and we have a, a host of live events, but we also have some virtual offerings as well. And we decided to put those on a special day. That's today, Make Music Day. Fête de la Musique, as it is also known in France where the, it, um, the international holiday originated uh, over two decades ago. Um, so it's a, a time that we really wanna celebrate music. So I do hope that in addition to enjoying today's uh, virtual talk um, with Dr. Melanie Turgeon of the, about a uh, Ukrainian art song, um, that you also take time to just enjoy music and celebrate music in your life throughout the day. Um, we had a wonderful virtual hour before, um, or you know, roughly 90 minute masterclass with uh, Dr. Emery Stevens on the area of African uh, American art song. And now it's my pleasure to dive into Ukrainian art song. Um, with Dr. Melanie uh, Turgeon. Am I saying that right, Turgeon? Yeah, you know, you can say Turgeon, which makes Turgeon. it sound a little okay. bit more French, but- Turgeon, um, Turgeon, I like that, right. Turgeon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, then, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Turgeon is um, with the Ukrainian project, a uh, Ukrainian song project, as well right. as the yeah. art song project, as well as the Institute. Um, and they are doing phenomenal work uh, to try to really bring to the surface um, this area, this genre of music, which hasn't gotten a lot of attention um, uh, in, uh, as a, let's put it this way, art song doesn't get attention, period, <laughs> in general, when you think about it. So now imagine within the art song realm where uh, the French and German and probably American and, and Italian are right at the top, uh, anything outside of that starts to fall to the wayside. So that, that's why it's been important to me to really strive to get Latin American art song and African American art song added to our roster. And so this year, it's an, it's an incredible honor, uh, particularly a timely one, uh, given the situation in Ukraine uh, and with the, the, the war that Russia has advanced on, um, not the people of Russia, but the government of Russia has advanced upon um, the citizens of Ukraine. Um, so it just felt like the perfect time to at least begin um, a musical dialogue. Uh, because we do know that sometimes that it's through the arts that we can elevate and at least get people interested politically. Um, and uh, so again, um, I, uh, her reputation precedes her. I have her bio, I've said, you've said sure, her all your bio, um, but I'll just start with the fact that she is at King's University um, where she is a professor there um, and the music director, uh, if I'm not mistaken, music director as well. Um, and so she has a background, um, not only in Ukrainian music in general, but in choral conducting. Um, and she uh, has worked with many singers. In fact, I'm hoping to get her actually to New York to do a live masterclass um, next year. Um, if our budget, uh, was, if we don't have any budget constraints, I would definitely like to have that happen. We thought we would start this year with a talk um, in our talk, and then next year we can advance into actually working with singers. But fear not, because she has some musical examples for you. It's just not going to be an hour of talking. She comes with music. <laughs> um, and so with that, I turn it over to Dr. Melanie Turgeon. Thanks very much. Uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be with you today. And, um, you know, before I begin, I just want to um, say that you know, don't be afraid to interrupt me at any time. You know, I, I like to keep things as casual as possible and as uh, kind of comfortable for, for everybody. And uh, if you have questions, if you have comments to make, by all means, uh, just please unmute, unmute yourselves and, uh, and uh, ask away. I'd love to hear from you. I, I would love to uh, meet you, but that'll probably take about 25% of the time that I have with you. So um, I'm just going to say that it's a pleasure to see the black squares with names in front of me. And um, if you wanna put your video on, you're more than welcome. And if you don't, I understand as well. So uh, I'm going to get going here. Um, um, I'm going to attempt to first share my PowerPoint here with you. So this is not my strong point, folks. So you'll have to just bear with me here. 
All right, so I'm going to go here and let's see if I'm smart enough to get it into the right view. Um, just give me a second here. All right, so hopefully you should see a slide that says uh, discovering forbidden art songs, the Ukrainian art song project. And, um, you know, M Melanie Turjan is such a Ukrainian name. I'm sure that you've thought of that already. And my maiden name is uh, Hladunevich. And uh, I decided, this was a hard decision for me, but I decided to change my name when I got married. Because... Um, it meant a lot to my husband. So I said, yeah, absolutely, I will do that. And uh, also because my maiden name used up half the alphabet. So that was also a little bit of a problem uh, as a performer because it would constantly be uh, mispronounced and misspelt and, and all those wonderful things as well. But uh, I'm immensely proud of my Ukrainian heritage and uh, much of my research has um, gone in that direction. So, um, I'm going to start with just some honest thoughts at this time. And for me personally, it's very difficult to watch the war in Ukraine from afar. And unquestionably, there is a conscious effort to wipe out Ukrainian identity and culture. And I'm sure that you have all noticed that on the news. As a scholar and a performer of Ukrainian descent, I feel obligated to make a conscious effort to ensure Ukrainian classical and sacred music obtains its rightful and proper placement on the world stage, alongside other famous composers. I've never been so motivated before in my career to ut utilize art as a weapon against war. And um, just, uh, I was telling Blair, um, just before most of you arrived, that just two, two days ago on Sunday, um, I conducted a major fundraising concert here in Edmonton for Ukrainian evacuees and refugees. And um, it was immensely successful. And uh, again, I, I am working very hard right now because now I think is, is an opportune time um, to help Ukrainian music find its rightful place in the world. And um, yeah, as you'll uh, dissertate uh, from being with me for the next while, um, there's very honest reasons why it hasn't become as popular as, for example, German Lieder and uh, French Chanson and other things like that. So um, I would love for you to unmute yourself right now and help me name um, Ukrainian composers who wrote art songs. And if you have none, I understand as well. Um, can we name one? Can we name two? Can we name three? And uh, Lasha Tukach can't answer this question, by the way, she's uh, exempt. Um, Lesha is uh, one of the main uh, chairs of the Ukrainian Art Song Project. So she's got all the answers to my questions. So she, I'm telling her she can't participate right now. Um, is, is there anybody who can uh, name any Ukrainian art song composers? And sadly, I can't see the chat right now just because of the view that I'm in. So if you don't mind just blurting them out, I would love to hear from you. I'll give you about 30 seconds. <laughs> And I'll look in the chat as well if I see anything. I'll okay, thanks, Blur. <laughs> no. No, exactly. No, <laughs> that's the problem. Um, <laughs> if not, like, why can't we name any Ukrainian art song composers? And why do we know so little about this repertoire? And uh, why is it not frequently performed like other art song composers? Well, there's good reason for that, and I, I want to share that with you. So um, we'll get there. As you are well aware, and I know that this is a review for everybody here, pretty much, um, a musical, uh, what is an art song? A musical composition with serious artistic purpose, uh, customarily written for voice and piano. The piano and voice equally share in the task of illustrating and intensifying the meaning of the poetry. Occasionally, you will see the incorporation of an additional instrument, such as a cello or a flute. However, this is not overly common. And the text is customarily written by highly regarded poets, and the poetry has high literary quality to it. Unlike a folk song, an art song is intended to be performed at a recital or other formal concert setting. 
texts are usually in different languages. Uh, countries have national names for this genre, like leader or melody, or solo spiuf, as it is commonly called in Ukrainian. The art song genre became well established and defined in some of Franz Schubert's early 19th century works. And um, Der Erkönig is one of the most famous, I would say, which sets the poetry of Johann Goethe. And then shortly thereafter, the art song genre continued to be popular in Germany, as well as in various other European countries, such as France and Russia and Bohemia and Poland. However, its ability to flourish in Ukraine was definitely impacted by two things something called Um's Ukas and the Bolshevik Revolution. So I just wanted to, um, first of all, uh, make a distinction uh, between obviously folk song and art song, and also to say that like other countries and uh, who, who have art song, Ukrainian art song is no different in that it is, you know, set for piano voice primarily, occasionally uses other instruments, and it uses uh, poetry of high quality. And that's something that's very important. By bringing in uh, Schubert's famous Urukunich, I wanted to just kind of get a general timeline established for you. So that's, you know, early 1800s, right? Um, and I always kind of joke about this, um, that Ukraine and its music history is always slightly behind. Um, and I'm not too sure why, um, but, you know, like uh, the Baroque period in, in one part of the world is, is at this time period. And, and then Ukraine, it's always just slightly, slightly later. Um, and it's no different with art song. Um's Ukas is a decree that was issued in 1876 by, say, at 1876, pardon me, by Tsar Alexander II of Russia, banning the use of the Ukrainian language in print, in performance, and in scores. Ukrainian composers were forced to break the law in order to write an art song. Did they do it? Absolutely, they did. Despite this sanction, in addition to other future cens censorships, Ukrainian composers still persevered and they secretly wrote art songs for the drawer. This decree was named after the German city Bad Ems, since it, this is where the decree became official. So there's this common phrase for the drawer. And um, literally, when... Um, we started collecting art songs for this project. They were coming from the most interesting places in the world in terms of mostly attics and basements. In other words, they were in hiding, hiding because of um, the, that inability uh, for it to be performed in its time. So it, uh, it existed, but it was just well hidden. And I'm sure lots perished in that process as well. But thankfully, we have plenty still left behind to share with the world. Now, the Bolshevik Revolution, Soviet society did not support the development of the Ukrainian art song. They did not like the fact that it was a Western tradition imported into the East. Any higher art was condemned by the Soviets to be formalist, aristocratic, bourgeoisie and intellectual. The Soviets encouraged folk music and propaganda music sung by semi-professional musicians. And despite these conditions, Ukrainian poets still wrote poems and Ukrainian composers still put these poems to music and many in the form of what we call art song. And you know these um, restrictions during Soviet times were no different for other genres. Um, I did my dissertation on um, kind of the suppression of choral music uh, during the Bolshevik revolution. And I, and I particularly focused actually on a Russian composer and um, also his relationship to a Ukrainian composer, Dmitro Botnyansky. So I wrote my dissertation on a composer by the name of Alfred Schnitke. And, you know, part of my, um, aim was to show how Russian composers were also um, had these restrictions put upon them as well. Anything that kind of threatened um, 
threatened the government in any way in terms of being something very artistic and inspirational and kind of out of the norm was suppressed at that time. And it was essentially illegal. Uh, obviously, the Ukrainian language took a big beating at that time from the point that it was it was simply illegal um, to have the Ukrainian language in, you know, in performances, in scores, that sort of thing. And there is some very interesting um, kind of stories in the sense that um, when I was doing my dissertation on Alfred Schnittke, uh, there was one premiere of his fourth symphony and he told the, the performers that I'll let you know if you can sing the text tonight. And it had the text of what we call the Bohorodetsidiva or a prayer to Mary within the fourth symphony. And he said, and if the wrong people are in the audience, you will vocalize and just simply sing on a neutral syllable. Uh, so very interesting how they uh, kind of worked around that. It ended up that they sang on a neutral syllable that evening. So they did not sing the text to his fourth symphony. And it was much the same with art songs. I'm, I'm just drawing a parallel with choral music. The appearance of Ukrainian art songs. So Mykola Lysenko was the first major Ukrainian composer to write art songs. Only in the 1950s did musicologists start publishing collections of Ukrainian classical music. Yet these editions were strongly academic and they did not facilitate nor encourage performance of this music. So in 2004, the Ukrainian Art Song Project was founded and the driving force behind it is the renowned British baritone Pavlo Hunka. And together with Canada's leading opera singers, Hunka has already recorded and released more than 16 CDs of Ukrainian art song. Now, um, who is Pavla Hunka and how is this project possible? Well, um, this project is possible uh, mostly because of a group of unbelievably dedicated volunteers, mostly in the Toronto area. And um, it's quite unbelievable how uh, supportive uh, a group of, you know, Ukrainian people uh, in Toronto has been uh, to Pavlo uh, as he started this project. And now um, can I continue to uh, kind of reap the benefits of that wonderful support. And they have uh, worked so hard to find donations, to find grants, and um, to basically keep this project afloat. And, you know, I'm very honored to be part of this project. And uh, when we were starting, I noticed that one of those great volunteers uh, joined us here today. And uh, Lala is uh, the co-chair of our summer institute. So I've uh, become wonderfully acquainted with Lala through that relationship of uh, our summer institute together, which, which I'll give you more information about. So uh, Pavlo Hunka was, oh, sorry, go ahead, please. And is that uh, me or is that somebody else? Does anybody have a question? I'm not too sure what happened there. Yeah, I'm not either. <laughs> <laughs> I think Pavlo is haunting us from the dead or something. No, he's not dead. I'm just making a bad joke. Um, I could hear his voice. Uh, so Pavlo used to be a lawyer and he uh, became an, uh, an opera star shortly thereafter. So he, Pavlo Hunka, he's born to a Ukrainian father and an English mother, and he studied, studied modern languages first and then practiced as a lawyer for four years before realizing that that wasn't his path in life. And then he commenced uh, vocal studies at the Royal Northern College of Music in the UK. And his career began at the Basel Opera Company in Switzerland. And, um, you know, here's a shout out to all those people who maybe don't like their job right now, that it's never too late to become the opera star that you uh, find in the shower. Um, Hunka founded the Ukrainian Art Song Project with the goal to record and promote these classical treasures and masterpieces of Ukrainian composers. This major multi-year project was continue, has continued to flourish and grow since its inception in 2004. 
So it's in some ways for me, it's hard to believe that we're nearing a 20 year mark of this project. I haven't been involved for all of those 20 years. Um, I think I came to be part of it uh, around 2009, if I'm not mistaken. So Pablo Junca is a, a British bass baritone and he has sung in more than 50 operas, uh, including at least 30 major roles in the world's leading opera houses under the baton of the world's uh, leading conductors. And maybe some of you have some familiarity with Pablo. We will watch a video of him singing towards the end, so you'll get to see um, how wonderfully expressive this fine singer is. The project is kind of broken down into three phases. And the first phase is the recording uh, phase. And uh, it all started with the composer Kirillo Stetsenko. So despite the fact that Mikola Lysenko predates the St St Stetsenko, pardon me, the art songs of Kirillo Stetsenko was the very first recording uh, project embarked on by the Ukrainian Art Song Project, and it was released in September of 2006. And um, I don't know if any of you uh, recognize any of these fine gentlemen. There's a real, uh, there's a lack of females in this photo, as you can see. Um, Albert Krywalt is at the piano. Um, Roman Boris is on cello, and some of you might recognize that name from the Griffin Trio. And then we have Russell Braun. Uh, ben Butterfield and Pavlo Hunka. So the first set of CDs was recorded by this group. And I'm sorry, I left out uh, Roman Hurko, who was the producer. And some of you might recognize Roman Hurko's name as being a composer. Uh, he resides in New York now, and um, he has uh, experience in stage production, uh, as well as he is a, a composer of uh, Ukrainian descent as well. Stetsenko, I'm quoting Pavlo here, Stetsenko was my first choice to record as he is an accessible to all composer, very melodic, equal in piano and voice, extremely expressive, and he chose very clear and direct texts. Stetsenko almost exclusively utilized the poetry of Ukrainians, such, such as Alexander Oles, Taras Shevchenko, Lesho Ukrainka, and Boris Rinchenko, among others. Themes of Stetsenko's art songs include social and political injustice, nature, love, quite often unfulfilled love, suffering, exile, despair, various folk themes, and particularly hope and resilience during hardship. And there's no doubt that um, Ukrainians have uh, suffered tremendously uh, over the course of their history from various invasions and more so in art in, in you know, our at least time of memory. We know of obviously the Bolshevik revolution and communist times and the Chernobyl disaster, things like that. Um, so, uh, and obviously now the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but that kind of um, unfortunate that those unfortunate circumstances have gone down through the generations. And it is unquestionably evident in how they write poetry and how they set music. It's, it's not, um, you can't find too many ex exceptionally cheerful uh, tunes. Um, you know, yes, the, it, it, they exist, but I would say primarily, uh, these are the themes um, that um, you know Ukrainian poets have written about and Ukrainian composers have uh, accepted and adopted and set to music. Um, so as you can see, some of these uh, interesting themes that I've, I've put before you. Resilience during hardship. So Stetsenko has a wonderful piece called Broken Harp, Harp Strings. And this song was composed during the Ukrainian Civil War of the 1920s. And the spirit is undaunted, but the harp strings are broken. Nevertheless, both the poet and the composer press onward with hope. And probably this is Stetsenko's last art song that he wrote. Um, Stetsenko ended up um, dying while doing priestly ministry. And he wasn't very old either. He actually um, got typhus while he was uh, ministering to people um, as a priest and uh, he died uh, um, from that disease. I'm going to play you a piece by the name of Vichirnya Pisnya or Even Song. 
And this is probably the most popular song ever written by Stetsenko. So if you've ever heard any song by Stetsenko, it might be this. Um, it is a lyrical evocation of the setting sun. And like a folk song, it's in, uh, it's in a, a strophic form. And for years, this was the signature sign off tune at the end of each broadcasting day for the Ukraine's state radio. And um, I'm gonna play uh, Ben Butterfield uh, singing this um, song for you. And this is from a performance uh, in Edmonton uh, several years ago in 2011. I'm just gonna try to turn it over here. Let's see. And this is a- before you go to bed tonight, drink a glass of this and surprise your doctor on your next eye exam. I was skeptical it. I'm confused. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> I don't see anything, anyone on. Um, it's uh, not working, Blair. I don't see anything unmuted, but I was just, oh, was that the video? Was that on your end, that video? Yeah, do you see anything on your screen right now or no? I do, I do. Now you're good? Yes. And it looks like it's music?
So here is the, I should have shared this initially, the translation of Stitsenko's even song. The hush of the evening descends upon the earth and the sun slowly sets in the grove. Oh, dearest bright sun, can it be that you are, are weary, that you are angry? Please linger a while. Shine on for an hour, it's too early to sleep. Warm and indulge us with your motherly tenderness. Then the refrain comes again. And the final strophe, but the sun doesn't listen. It sets over the mountain and bids us adieu for the rest of the night. And um, obviously uh, it was very emotional when this was the final time that, that song was played on the radio program uh, before it was uh, shut down um, during communist times. So what has been done so far with the Ukrainian Art Song Project? Well, they have uh, recorded 42 songs by Kirilla Stutsenko. It's a two CD set and it's published Mykola Lysenko. Uh, they have recorded 124 songs by Mykola Lysenko and it's in a six CD package. And um, then they went on to Yakiv Stepove, uh, 55 songs by Yakiv Stepove over, and uh, it's put over two CDs. And then there was also a Trashevchenko uh, poetry compilation CD that was made. Uh, Trashevchenko is a, a, uh, definitely the most uh, famous Ukrainian poet. And um, many uh, Ukrainian composers have set his uh, poems to music. Thereafter, they went into what they call Galician composers. So two CD sets include the songs of eight composers. Uh, grouped together under the title Galician, meaning that they are they all come from a similar region in Ukraine called uh, Galicia or Halichina. And this region is uh, is currently spanning, I'm sorry, I lost my PowerPoint there. Okay, so hold on, sorry. I'm trying to make it a full screen and that's not working. Just give me one second. I'll go back into the presenter's view. This is a little nicer, sorry. And this region is currently spanning southeastern Poland and western Ukraine. And uh, the eight composers included in the Galician set are Denis Sitchinsky, uh, Stanislav Ludkevich, Vasil Barvinsky, Stefania Turkevich, Ostap Nizhenkiewski, his son, Nestor Nizhenkiewski, uh, Yaroslav Lopatinsky, and Miroslav Volinsky, who is still living. Um, Galicians won includes four of these eight composers. And um, Denis Sichinsky wrote over a hundred Ukrainian art songs, but only 16 have been found and recorded. And the remainder, unfortunately, still seem to be lost. Uh, Stanislav Lyudkevich composed approximately 47, 28 have been found and recorded already. already. Uh, interestingly enough, several of these songs are in, their, uh, are in German. Uh, Vasil Barvinsky wrote 47 songs, and thus far 17 have been found and recorded. Many are for violin and voice. So if you're looking for something a little bit different in your recital, obviously you might want to check out the songs of Vasil Barvinsky. And then Stefania Turkevich, um, 20 songs of hers have been discovered and recorded. And she is considered to be Ukraine's first significant female composer. And um, Stefania, uh, his music is very interesting sounding because uh, she uh, studied with Schoenberg. Um, so I hope at the end, I'll have a chance to play you one song by Stefania Turkevich, just so you get a sense of, uh, of her music. Galicians 2 is, uh, includes uh, father and son here, Ostap and um, Nestor, and uh, 17 songs by each, and then Yaroslav Lopatinsky, uh, a composer and also a physician. Uh, and Miroslav Volinsky is a composer who's still living in Lviv right now, and 51 of his songs have been discovered and recorded. What has been recorded to date is 486 songs, if you can believe, by these various composers. And uh, what work remains? The dream is this, folks, to record approximately just over 1,100 art songs. Um, so these few composers here at the top, uh, some of their art songs have already been recorded. So this is what remains of their uh, output. And then these are a lot of contemporary composers, mostly living composers still. 
and um, we hope to eventually get to their uh, songs as well. So a real, uh, a real diverse, um, you know, obviously uh, type of music, everything from, you know, early romantic uh, music all the way to quite uh, beautifully contemporary sounding music. So the singers that have been involved in this project to date, I just want to give you a sense of the type of singers Pavlo has used in the past to do these recordings. And you'll notice that uh, these are not uh, these are not slouch names by any means. Um, uh, these are more so Canadians, so maybe some of them you're not familiar with. But um, yeah, some some fine singers have been involved in this project. I'll let you uh, browse through this list, and um, very unfortunately, Laura McAlpine, who was one of the mezzo sopranos on one of the recordings, passed away um, after merely a ten week battle with cancer. Uh, in her 30s, which is most unfortunate. But um, as you can see, there's some, uh, there's a kind of an abundance of talent that has been willing to join Pavlo on this journey in our recording up until now. It's no different with instrumentalists. Um, maybe some of you will recognize some of these names. Um, we have uh, Roman Boris from the Griffin Trio, and then his uh, colleague, who is the violinist within the Griffin Trio. I won't attempt to pronounce her last name. And uh, we have a fine uh, assortment of great pianists. And this year, we're adding two more pianists uh, to our kind of list, and that includes uh, Dr. Leanne Regeer here from Edmonton, Alberta, and uh, Stephen Phil Cox from Toronto. I'm going to move on to a piece by Mikola Lysenko, and this is his The Boundless Plain. Oh, boundless plain of snowy dunes, release me, give me freedom, alone on a horse amid your expanse with unbearable pain in my heart. Carry me over the field, my steed, like the wind that blows the snow. Can I ever escape the dreadful pain that I think tears my heart asunder? So I'm going to share Pavlo Hunka singing this song for you. Um, and I hope it goes without commercial. Here we go. Let me try this once again. Uh, Bessie. Comfortable, stylish, and 100% waterproof. And, done, and when you're folks. training a dog, you have to go. get out and As I'm sure you can gather, Pavlo is a wonderfully expressive singer. Um, while I'm getting organized here again, are there any questions or anything that anybody wants to ask, or do I just motor on? It's it's hard when you're on Zoom because you don't see expression, you don't see faces, and and uh, please uh, let me know if uh, if you want to ask anything. Well, I was definitely clapping after that last performance. That was fantastic. <laughs> well, I wanted to at least give you a sense of 
the like the range of uh, you know what is what's what's necessary to perform some of this music. Obviously, uh, Ben's piece was strophic; it was relatively straightforward. The range wasn't too crazy. He made it a little crazier by choosing the ending he did. Um, and then there's Pavlo, uh, like that one minute of intense. Uh, uh, singing and the piano kind of did wasn't playing do re mi for the whole thing either, as you probably noticed. So um, yeah, there's there's I think you'll find anything um, in Ukrainian art song if you're looking for repertoire. Anything uh, anything else before I head forward? Yes, um, I put something in chat. This is Judith. Okay. Um, when you pronounce the name of Even Song, it sounded distinctly Czech, um, and I recognize the words as Czech words. Mm -hmm. Can you say something as uh, how close Ukrainian is or isn't to Czech? Uh, I know it's a little close to Russian, but you can't, you know, obviously translate it completely. Yeah. Um, and would you say the name of that song again? Uh, it was probably Vecirnia Pisnia is probably what I said back then. Yes. And that and sounds exactly like a Dvorak songs. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, you know, okay. I don't know Czech, um, but uh, when I was in Slovakia quite a few years ago on tour with one of my groups, um, I was speaking Ukrainian to many of them because they didn't know English. And that was easier than English because they could understand about 50% of it. So mm -hmm. there's got to be some significant similarities uh, between the two languages um, because it was either that or play charades. Uh, and we did not too bad with me speaking Ukrainian and them speaking Czech. So we kind of found some common ground in between. But because I don't know Czech at all, um, I can't say how similar or, or dissimilar those two languages are. So I apologize. But absolutely, you know, uh, if you can understand uh, more or less the title of that piece and some similarities there, that's wonderful. Um, Thank you very much. That's very helpful. Yeah, no problem. Uh, as I said, the first phase of the project was recording, and I'll update you that um, now, uh, yet prior to the war in Ukraine, Pavlo uh, chose to move the recording to Ukraine for a few reasons. Obviously, it's cheaper, and he wanted to start involving uh, students that he has, you know, kind of done master classes and summer institutes with and for them to be people on the next set of recordings. Um, so we are no longer recording in Toronto at the Glen Gould Studio with uh, um, some of the top Canadian opera singers around. Uh, the project has kind of taken an, a more modern shift in that you know it is now uh, primarily being recorded in Ukraine and everything is online. We're no longer making these uh, uh, wonderful like big booklets of Ukrainian art songs and stuff. All the information is still uh, accessible online because you'll see that for every piece and stuff, there's a wonderful explanation in, in four languages and, and little um, uh, synopsis written about every single, uh, every single song on every one of these recordings so far. So the next phase after the recording is the scores. And um, the second phase involves the launch of what we call our worldwide library, namely the actual printed scores for every recorded art song. And it's taken more than uh, 35 years to amass all these art songs and through the wonders of modern technology, anybody in the world at any time can access and download this music in an instant and for free. And the excellent features of the website should remove any fear or, uncertain, or, of, or, or uncertainty, pardon me, of how to perform this music successfully. Um, so some features that exist on our website is that uh, it makes it possible for Ukrainians and non-Ukrainians to perform this music with ease and authenticity. So all scores, uh, as I said, are, can be downloaded for free. They can be transposed into any key. Uh, the text, yes, is printed in Cyrillic, but it's also transliterated. And uh, there's also a thorough pronunciation guide available for download. And we're currently working on an IPA transliteration guide um, so that we can find IPA equivalents for as many Ukrainian vowels and consonants uh, as possible. The scores are in public domain and they're not copyrighted, so you can duplicate them, you can distribute them, you could perform them as you wish. And I'm going to, uh, um, I'll show you, uh, actually, I'll just keep rolling and I'll show you a score sample in a moment here. Um, 
one can search either in English, uh, you know, obviously with Latin characters, um, or if you have a Cyrillic font, you can search in Ukrainian. Uh, you can search all the scores uh, for specific keywords, like let's say you're doing a, you know, a specific recital on nature or whatnot. Um, you can search those keywords and everything will come up for you. Song titles, composers' names, lyricists' names, we have all different ways that you can search. Uh, in addition to keyword search, you can, um, you know, you can go by albums and stuff. So I, I invite you to find uh, the Ukraine Art Song Project website and to have fun. Um, you can select what vocal range you want to download, like soprano to tenor bass, and then you can also um, choose to do it to just download it as PDF or Sibelius score. If you choose Sibelius, it allows you to make modifications to transpose it. So if you don't have the program Sibelius score on your computer, you'll have to download it, and then that allows you to transpose the score into any key. Um, you can hear the MIDI version of the music, so you get an idea of what the song sounds like with the accompaniment, and you can, you know, obviously manipulate playback tempos and stuff like that. Anything to ease your learning of the score. Um, I will mention that uh, we do have our original Ukrainian Art Song Project website. And then uh, more recently, the work that Pavlo has done in Ukraine, he has started kind of a second Ukrainian Art Song Project website. So uh, at, possibly at the end, I'll give you the address to both of those so that you know kind of, uh, if you're looking for you know the scores and stuff right now, they are on this uh, particular website. And, and uh, if you just keep searching, I, you'll, you'll find it exactly what you need. Now, listen to the Tsenko, the first two composers that were recorded um, in 1899, whilst the uh, Tsenko was in the seminary, he became um, acquainted with Lysenko. And he was his student, as well as a singer and assistant conductor in Lysenko's choir. And Lysenko really mentored Stetsenko and introduced him to several significant poets and musicians. And he commented uh, to that group that this is who's going to replace me after my death. Now, Lysenko is particularly known for uh, his ethnomusicological endeavors, and he really encouraged that. He wanted his students and his colleagues to make use of folk songs and to work with them and to be inspired by them and to appreciate their beauty, not only as a part of the past, but also as a vital um, a kind of fragile elements of, of a contemporary tradition. Lysenko, Leontovich, Kosic, Tetsenko, these are all composers that contributed to a national movement in Ukrainian, compose, in Ukrainian composition, pardon me, which involved the creative use of folk materi materials. These individuals caused the emergence of a new school of national music, and they tried to do for Ukraine what they witnessed in other national composers like uh, Smetna and Dvorak. And again, there's that parallel being made to Czech composers. What does this national style of composition involve? Actually going out into the villages and collecting folk materials and using these folk materials as sources for arrangements, often quoting folk songs, uh, using dance rhythms, basing entire works on folk customs or folk rituals, composing melodies that are very broad and patriotic. This style boasts beautiful lyrical melodies and rich harmonies. When music has text, there is a high frequency of utilizing the work of Ukrainian poets and librettists. So they obviously chose primarily Ukrainian poets and librettists. And I wanted to just give you a sense of some of the poets that are included in this music. And as you can see, there are uh, an awful lot of names you can't pronounce. So those are the Ukrainian composers. Um, but there's also very interesting, some uh, like Heinrich Heine is on this list. And um, just within the first, you know, two or three CD uh, booklets that were created, already there was 16 songs of, uh, or po po pardon me, poems of his that Ukrainian composers set. Um, so there's some very famous Ukrainian composers here, like I mentioned, uh, Shevchenko, Oleksandr Oles, also is a very famous Ukrainian composer, Lesha Ukrainka, a female composer, Ivan Franko, and then uh, then we have the German, uh, very, I would say, uh, you know, poetic legend, Heinrich Heine, is included in this list as well, just to give you a sense of where the poetry comes from. 
phase three of our project is performing and promoting this music. So um, one of the main reasons why Pavlo chose, uh, you know, um, thriving opera singers in Canada to record those first several CDs with was so that they could hopefully um, use it in their careers and also with their students and help it get into the community as best as possible. And um, uh, initially upon completion of each C CD set, they were having launch concerts to promote it. And more recently, these launch events have been incorporated into other productions that we are having. Um, so in 2017, the Ukrainian Art Song Project launched something called its Summer Institute. And it is a week-long program that intends to immerse rising artists into all aspects of Ukrainian art song. And it ends with a concert. So it is a superb opportunity for singers to collaborate with highly accomplished faculty who are eager to share their experience and ex expertise in a rather informal but very supportive atmosphere. And the small group format really fosters collegiality. It's ideal for making lasting connections in your uh, classical music making. Um, so those of you who are you know, uh, students and maybe are recent graduates or whatnot, you might consider our Summer Institute in future years. This is the advertisement for this year's Summer Institute. It's at the end of August. Um, it's a little shorter than a week this year. We have been in hiatus because of COVID and we didn't want to bite off too much, uh, uh, not, you know, more than we could chew, so to speak. Uh, so it is going to be five very full days uh, with these fine uh, faculty members. So uh, Ben Butterfield from the University of Victoria, Andrea Ludwig, who is uh, from Toronto, uh, Le Dr. Leanne Regeer, who uh, works with me here at the King's University in Edmonton, and she also works at the University of Alberta. And then uh, Dr. Stephen Philcox, who is uh, from Toronto, and uh, he works at the University of Toronto. So I cannot encourage those of you who are uh, looking for something to do in the summer to consider uh, joining us in the capacity of a singer. Um, I'm going to play you something by Stefania Turkevich to end our time together. And then I will open up the floodgates to all your questions. So I'm going to play you a piece by Stefania entitled, I Shall Come to You. And uh, here is the poetry. It says, the orchards have flowered in a thin veil of drops and a dream like a light breeze. O distant one, come back to me. I shall come in the evening when white petals flutter down in the orchard. From a touch of the hand, I shall come in the evening so that when dawn returns in the quiet orchard, we shall call to the distant land together. I shall come in the evening. Now, the, a brief synopsis, this is dedicated to her first husband, who was a painter, Robert Yusovsky. This is an evening serenade expressing the longing of two lovers for each other. In the, twi in the twilit orchard grove, they will meet and their cries of ecstasy will carry far on. So I'm going to uh, transition us into this song by Stefania Turkevich. And you'll notice it's quite different uh, from Stetsenko and Lysenko. And this is the female composer who studied with Schoenberg.
That's marvelous. Wow. Yeah. So um, I just want to also mention that for these summer institutes, um, the committee in Toronto has created these exceptional anthologies of uh, music. And these anthologies um, obviously have the score, they have the transliterated text, they have a poetic translation, they have a, a word for word translation within the score um, so that you can obviously communicate your text uh, to a high level. And um, yeah, we try our best to make it as possible as we can for non-Ukrainians to uh, embrace this music as well and be able to sing it uh, with authenticity. So I, I welcome your questions, um, please, uh, whatever you, want to ask, don't hold back. I am just so you know, I put in the uh, in the chat box the uh, link to the EU, uh, the Ukrainian art song um, mm -hmm. at CA for Canada, uh, which has more information about the, the Institute <clears throat> um, this summer. Um, and then I'm also putting in their um, uh, public radio program uh, based in Hawaii, Singing and Other Sins, um, I know Gary, the uh, founder of that, has uh, an entire archive of um, programs he's done in the past on Art Song, and uh, several of which uh, are focused on Art Song from Ukraine. So oh, neat. Great. So, any questions for Dr. Turjan? I hope you're still awake out there, folks. <laughs> uh, everyone is always bashful when it comes to uh, um, Zoom. I don't know if it's because we oh, sometimes we listen to this in our underwear or with a towel <laughs> on our head, but um, but definitely if you're if the sign is on, sorry, if your image is off, don't be shy about asking your yeah. questions. I do see teachers on. Um, I know Professor Nicosia just asked the one about. Um, Czech and Ukraine. Yeah. I see Juilliard singers on. I, I know uh, Dr. Grace Hackett is on. So we do have some people very much in interested in this repertoire. Okay. I'm just not sure if they have any questions. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to know where the, uh, the the summer program was going to be. Is it going to be in Canada? Is it going to be on Zoom? Yeah, no, it's, it's in person at uh, in Toronto, and we're hosting it at the Royal Conservatory uh, building, which oh. is uh, just right in downtown Toronto. And there's a beautiful uh, Timothy Theater there that we're uh, using for this uh, um, for this institute. Uh, so it's a great facility right in downtown uh, Toronto, pretty much next door to the ROM, the Royal um, Art Museum. So okay. we're going to have lots of fun there for one week. Right, and it's nothing, not in New York. Nothing. No, New York. it's not. Um, Sorry. And then um, a second question, uh, when one learns the uh, Ukrainian songs, mm -hmm. um, I, I, I would like to think that I should be singing it in, in the language that it's, you know, I would like to, in other words, I, I don't think I should sing Ukrainian songs in English. I don't know of any that exist, to be honest with you. Yeah. I don't know of anybody who has ever translated uh, yeah. Ukrainian art songs at all. So, yeah. Okay. And is the language, um, is it any more difficult to learn, say, than German or French? No. Um, you know, I think what people struggle with the most is there's a lot of um, consecutive consonants uh, often. Um, you know, and like one Ukrainian letter, which is like, for example, a sh uh, can take uh, four like Latin letters to transliterate. It's like S-H-C-H -H to get that one sound a sh okay. in Ukrainian. So that's what um, often people struggle with is, uh, you know, it's like the old, uh, what was that called? Wheel of Fortune. You want to buy a vowel so often because you can't, you got way too many cl uh, consonant clusters to worry about and you need something uh, to, you know, to help you with that. But, you know, I would say that's probably the, the most challenging thing. And then with the vowels, they're all um, very much like Latin vowels, like an A ah is always an A ah, and as always an A and E oh, is, okay. and always, you know what I mean? Um, and I'll just clarify that transliteration 
is using Latin characters to show you how to pronounce the Ukrainian. It's not a translation of the text. Um, so there's, there are no singing translations in English of any of this music. Like nobody has ever done that before. Okay. Um, and you know, I hope they don't, um, right, cause right. I'm, a, I'm a real, uh, you know, kind of a bugger for authenticity. And I often mm -hmm. find it, you know, um, unfortunate when I see, you know, like a Bach piece or something like that. And somebody's put some cheesy English lyrics to it that don't really fit what Bach intended uh, with that piece, for example. So yeah, right now, all that exists is uh, the Ukrainian text. But I will be honest that some, like we saw, uh, like there was one uh, composer who said a bunch of German texts as well, um, that often existed because, you know, obviously they were persecuted for using the Ukrainian language uh, at so many times. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I look forward to at least learning two songs in, in, um, you yeah, know, absolutely. The original language. Yeah. Yeah. Good thank luck. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, there's a question I see in the chat. If you're reading the Cyrillic, is the pronunciation different from Russian? It is. Um, Russian is, uh, like you'll find some similarities don't get me wrong but like if i'm singing a russian art song you know depending on where the metric accent falls you know oz become us and all those wonderful things none of that exists in ukrainian uh you know so there's similarities with a lot of the consonants absolutely but it's the vowels that you have to be a little bit conscious of there's some very different vowels and i think easier vowels in ukrainian uh like russian's got that one for sound that we don't have uh thankfully it's just an e or a e and stuff like that so um yeah i would say quite different so you have to really kind of have a look at the transliteration and the guides that exist i see one more that preceded it let's see what is this okay. one uh, beautiful music and lyrics how has the program in ukraine been impacted by war I don't know if she means the music program yeah, or the, probably um, the recording I'm thinking is what yeah. she's asking about. Yeah. Um, you know, I just talked to Pavlo the other day and he said that they're still managing to do a little bit of recording. I, I personally, I, I don't understand how that's even possible because I have friends in Lviv, which is where he is right now. And those sirens are going off like five, six times a day, like the sirens for them to seek shelter because they feel that there's a, a threat. Um, you know, some days you get by with maybe three or four, but on average, they said it's about five times a day, at least that uh, you're asked to, you know, leave your home and go into some sort of a bomb shelter. Um, so mm -hmm. I can't see that being great for recording. Uh, uh, so yes, they're still trying to do what they can, but um, no, it's been extremely difficult and obviously it has slowed down production uh, substantially. Wow. Yeah. Very, you know, I, I was just watching the Van Cliburn competition that just uh, wrapped up this year and uh, my favorite pianist turned out to be a Ukrainian pianist um, mm -hmm. and he was, doing, he was doing so well. He ended up ultimately getting um, third place, uh, which is, of course is still wonderful but I, I had me wondering you know is he now going back home or I, I was just I was wondering oh my god how is he leading doing his practice lead, you know <laughs> in a war because he does live in Ukraine at the moment so it's mm. just it's just very striking that you these you're still doing these uh, living day to day is of course something of Herculean proportion but to try and factor in things like doing a recital doing a recording yeah. for the Van Cliburn I'm like it's just it's incredible yeah, thankfully the recording that, uh, like the recording for the Ukrainian Arts Talk project has all been in Western Ukraine up until now. And, you know, Western Ukraine is close, closest to Poland. And that has been much safer, obviously, than Eastern Ukraine. Like Eastern Ukraine is not, most places are not um, habitable, right? You can't be living still there. Or if you are, you're stuck in some bomb shelter and you haven't been out for, for weeks or months. Um, but Western Ukraine is a little bit obviously better, but you know, even that, uh, my friend on Thursday texted me and she said, she goes, a bomb just landed about 20 kilometers from where I am right now. Like we felt it. And she goes, it's just like such stress that we're living under. You have no idea. Cause you never know what's going to happen day to day, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I do see another question in there. I'm not sure if you got to see that one. Dr. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like the folk idioms.
I'm not sure I understand oh, what you're actually doing. Yeah, I'm hoping I'm understanding your question correctly. So, um, like, was those were those uh, com compositions banned? The ones that were used folk idioms, absolutely, they were banned. Um, the Ukrainian language was banned. Uh, so, um, anything Ukrainian, they tried to, uh, you know, obliterate. Well, if, if there are no more questions, uh, we we definitely uh, want to kind of close out, begin closing out the hour. Uh, but I just want to, first of all, thank you, the audience, for tuning in today. I know it's um, mm. the middle of the afternoon for many of you uh, and early in the morning for others <laughs> uh, that I see came in from uh, uh, Hawaii. And then um, I, I just know, you know, so thank you for, for allowing this to be a part of your day on Make Music Day. And, uh, um, and obviously our heartfelt thanks uh, to Dr. Turjan um, and to the Ukrainian Art Song Project um, and you know our, our support is with the Ukrainian people and I think it's a perfect time to really begin to discover this music I you know I'm a art song specialist and I have to confess I knew nothing um, and this is just a wonderful way to begin my education as a student um, and I'm looking forward to I already picked out my first piano piece by a Ukrainian composer to learn and I look forward to learning an art song as well too um, yeah. so thank you thank you Dr. Turgeon yeah thank you and uh, you know you know where to find me. I think uh, I shared my contact information with you. Um, absolutely, reach out if you have questions and you need some support in your in your learning. Uh, and uh, you know, I really encourage you. Uh, as I opened with that phrase, that um, art and music is a weapon against this war right now. And uh, I ask you to take a stand and uh, help us not allow um, the Russian invasion to obliterate Ukrainian culture and and identity at this time. Absolutely, indeed. Well, I did drop in information. I'm sure you all saw it. It was, it was in the email as well. So if you'd like to, if you're trying to think about how you can help and you still haven't, or if you, if you already have and find yourself able to do more, um, there are various sites uh, that I've included in that one link that will direct you to that. Um, and, and then lastly, if you are around in Manhattan this evening for our Make Music Concert uh, featuring several singers from this week's festival. Please join us at six o'clock in uh, Mikowski Hall at Manhattan School of Music. Um, and then lastly, the final masterclasses of the week, Italian song in the morning and German leader in the afternoon. That's tomorrow with Thomas Morocco. Uh, French Melody by Francis Poulain with Thomas Grubb, Thursday morning at 11 a.m. Uh, and in the afternoon, Claude Debussy Melody. Uh, so it's a French day. And we'll end the week on Friday uh, with Neil Seamer, not really art song, but it's perfect for the recital. And that's the Great American Songbook. Um, I love those <laughs> pieces from the, from the 20th century, early 20th century to mid 20th century. So um, those standards by Irving Berlin, Gershwin, Hammerstein, they're, they're all there. Uh, so I invite you to join us for that in the morning and end the festival with Mark Markham, uh, the collaborative partner to Jesse Norman for two decades. Uh, will be presenting his master class, which she has some French, German, and American art song all thrown in there. So thank you, Dr. Terjan. Thank you, participants. Yeah, I look forward to seeing you all at a future event. Bye-bye.